This is Mad Data, a data quality podcast by Data Band. Hey, Josh, how's it going? It's going great. Hi, Honor. Excited to be on the program again today talking all things data. Um, excited to have Johannes Lepa on the program today. Uh, Johannes is a senior data engineer at Comodo Health. And uh, we have him in to talk about his experiences as a data engineer and building the data infra over at at Komodo. So uh, great to have you on, Johannes. Thanks for joining us. And um, why don't you start by just telling us a bit about uh, your background? Right. Uh, Thank you, Charles, for the introduction. Thank you, Honor. Uh, It's certainly uh, a pleasure to be here talking with you about the, the data stuff today. Very excited about that. But to start with a little bit, uh, about myself, I've been now working for a handful of years uh, at Commodore Health in different kinds of roles under uh, data engineering. And most of the time for the past several years, I've been mostly working on data ingestion and for the past couple of years, uh, leading different data ingestion teams uh, that we have. That's kind of what I've been lately concentrating on. Very cool. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about Commodore Health and what you do for customers? Yeah, certainly. So the mission of Commodore Health is to reduce the global burden of disease. And for that, we are offering a suite of applications, for example, to, say, analyze patient populations or sites of care uh, for profiling influence of healthcare providers in specific therapy areas, for clinical alerting, uh, for engagement that enables more timely intervention along patient journey. And to give just one very concrete example of that, Let's say we have a client that's about to launch a clinical trial. Uh, maybe they want to analyze a, like a patient population to uh, see if there are more potential patients uh, for their trial, and they would need more of those for the trial to be successful. So that's kind of uh, just a very concrete example. But kind of all these different solutions that we provide are powered our uh, very comprehensive data asset called Healthcare Map. We are a very data-heavy company. Interesting. So, so what would be a kind of insight that you provide to your end users? What's an analytic at the end of the stream that they may be um, excited about receiving? Yeah, so that there's a lot of different um, use cases for that, uh, kind of what I, on a very high level, touched upon. Like, for example, in this, like, a, like one concrete example of a clinical trial, it could be like understanding where the suitable populations would be. And and that would in itself be very valuable. And potentially, let's say, there could be even a chance to like choose the site of your clinical trial, and you would like to do that so that it's close to the patients so that you would be getting that. And kind of on the other end of the spectrum, like uh, let's say there is a a therapy that is specific for a very, uh, let's say, rare disease. It's very hard to to find like who would be the patients that would uh, like benefit from this therapy, but maybe it would need to be very timely intervention for them to to get that benefit. So then this sort of um, like like uh, alerting information of like clinical events that are indicators uh, of a patient that would benefit of that therapy, and then that information might be something that uh, would then be useful for for uh, that sort of clients. So there's a kind of a big variation. Uh, on these use cases. Interesting. And uh, what are the kinds of data sources that you're actually plugging into and ingesting from to be able to pull the data that you need for that, those types of insights? Yeah, so that is where things get complex because it's a very, the, the healthcare system is very complex, like uh, kind of with those examples already provide this, uh, a lot of different entities. There are healthcare providers and organizations uh, like doctors and hospitals, there are healthcare insurance companies, there are biopharma companies that develop and provide products, laboratory testing. Um, and then obviously there's the patient and their patient interactions with this system. There are uh, visits uh, to a doctor, stays in hospital, labs tested. And this is a lot of entities, a lot of actions, and the data tends to be very fragmented. And that's a big problem that different kinds of data assets 
usually cover a very small piece of this information. So in order to have like a, like a, the ability to answer a very complex questions, you, you want to have a very like complete view of that. Uh, and now a lot of these, um, like, like a lot of these sources, if you only have like a very like incomplete picture, you can have a lot of bias in your in your answers. Like maybe you only know about patients of certain type, certain type of um, populations, or even just only certain type of ge uh, geographical areas. And that might, might not be what you're actually looking for. So then going into those like sources directly, we don't really like create any of the data. So all the sources are kind of external uh, to us. And there are several like publicly available and proprietary uh, data sources that we have uh, to give some examples, like um, for example, of clinical trials, uh, there is publicly available information of that, that what other clinical trials are happening in the world. But then as an example of like a proprietary data set, like earlier this year, we announced partnership with Blue Health Intelligence and, uh, and the related data that covers like medical and pharmacy claims of more than 300 million de-identified people. Uh, that would be kind of a, a like example of a data set on like very different end of the spectrum. And it is a lot of your secret sauce. Is it in how you take data from all these different sources and aggregate it in inter interesting ways together so that you can see how different associations in the data might lead to new kinds of analytics and insights, like seeing how patient data from a hospital relates to uh, data that's being picked up from different you know, pharma studies, things like that. Is it, is it a lot about how you aggregate the data together or is it more how you extract insights from all these different unique data sources and sort of different channels of analytics that you're doing? Yeah, so it, it is certainly a combination of those. That there, one thing is that because of this like fragmentation, being able to reliably link uh, the data sources and different types of information together is certainly a big aspect uh, of the uh, of the quality of the data asset and, uh, and about the value that Commodore is bringing. On the other hand, you need a very complete set of inputs that even if you are able to, the data assets that you have, you're able to link them correctly, but if the inputs just don't have the coverage, you're still going to have uh, gaps and biases. So it's both kind of the the, the coverage of the data assets put together, the linkage to actually like make them work uh, correctly, uh, and then also, and then finally, there is the the analysis on top of it. Like, how do you actually now that you have all of that data, uh, how do you make, uh, how do you use it uh, to answer the questions that you have? How do you analyze it? And then, and that's why we have this like multi layer approach where we are getting the data in, we are creating like a reconciled data product layer that has the comprehensive information. And then on top of that, there is the actual like uh, more client facing applications that are then analyzing that uh, data in different ways, depending on that client use case. Tell us more about the, the stages of that data flow and how you're managing different ends of the process and what kind of tools you're, you're using to get the data in, to get it ready in some, it sounds like some sort of staging or maybe pre-processing layer, and then how it moves into your analytical system. Curious how you manage that. So that's, a, that, that's a, like a very uh, layered setup indeed. So kind of starting from the beginning, that's where like I do most of my work, that in the very beginning where we talk about ingestion, that's a word that a lot of people use and they sometimes mean different things. So kind of what we have under like the ownership of the data ingestion team is actually several phases. We have like a, by design divided it that way. So the first phase is just extraction that we are, most of the deliveries are coming in as files so whatever that source location is, we call it external location. It might be owned by, by us or by the, the, the source where the data is delivered from. And the first step is just extracting the files that are delivered into our internal 
system internal location. And, and there isn't really, and in that layer, we have to deal with a different variation related to the, uh, to the interfaces. Like is the delivery via SFTP or S3? Is it, uh, well, in some cases we might even get like hard drives, which we usually causes us a lot of trouble. We would like to have cloud solutions uh, normally. But, and, and even with those, there can be variation in like, let's say how we are authenticating. Like S3, is it just like credentials that we use? Maybe there is an IAM role that has allowed to access. Um, so all of that variation kind of needs to be handled just to extract the original file to that location. And there we, we don't really touch that file at all. We don't make any changes yet at that point. And we, we just keep track of some metadata information, original file name, original delivery time uh, to track that. I'm just curious how in that initial phase, it sounds like you're dealing with a lot of different data sources. Um, you're dealing with a lot of different types of data coming in, a lot of different structures of data. How do you manage that layer internally? What kind of tools are you using there to just make sure that the data from the source is coming in as you expect it to? That, that's a good call. And then most of that is actually handled by the next layer. So on this layer, the tooling that we are using for that, we, we are our pipelines are orchestrated using Airflow. And those interfaces, we, we actually have like built a tooling in-house. There isn't really, there's so many different, like kind of different variation to, to that extraction that we've kind of found it easier for us to, to handle these nuances with something that we can then, like that we have the full flexibility uh, to build it ourselves uh, as opposed to, to use like an off-the-shelf tool and then like try to figure out if it can actually handle like all of these uh, these use cases. So you didn't you didn't feel that there was a managed tool like a Fivetran out there that could have offloaded this work from your team. You needed to build up these processes internally. Uh, yeah, that that is correct, and it comes a little bit more clear when we get to the to the next stage uh, where we are doing actually the what we call like raw data ingestion, and we actually have spent a lot more time on working on that one, and there are come to the reasons why we are using like in-house tooling for that. And once that had been built, utilizing the same structure also for this extraction piece was kind of a much smaller push. So there wasn't really that much benefit in searching uh, for a different tool that could potentially like serve just for that particular uh, use case. Makes sense. Um, was, there, was there any way that you st structured your pipelines or structured those extraction ingestion processes that have allowed you to scale up effectively when you're managing all those different um, all those different uh, pipelines, all those different data pools um, because this is uh, avoiding this is exactly the reason why folks lean on external tools. So when you don't really have that option, curious if you have any best practices and in, in making it feel more manageable. That certainly has been we've felt that pain and we've kind of found out some uh, solutions uh, to that ourselves, and it's kind of a. I, I kind of clarify that with the with the system that we have in place for the for the raw data ingestion, because that's where it really kind of like nails down to to the approach that we have. Because now, when we have just like gotten that original file to our system, and and there, we we don't really care anything else except just getting that file in and keeping the metadata. But now. The next step is to actually get it into into the like a format that we want to deal with, and we are using Parquet files on S3 as our like uh, data format of choice. But now we are delivered files in in usually in different formats. Like they can be like compressed files or or not, and they can be CSV that we get often, text files, Parquet files, ORC files, fixed width files. In the worst case, like Windows executables, that's painful again, but we are like, there's a variation like what that original file even is before we can get to see what the data like in itself is. And that's why we have this raw ingestion step. We have a couple of logical, logical stages. First, we take the original file and prepare it to a format where we can convert it to Parquet. And these steps that might be happening in that 
that case is maybe decompression might be needed. Maybe we need to remove some characters that would uh, cause errors when parsing it to Parquet. So there are some some minor steps that we do in order to have a file that can be easily converted to Parquet. Then we do that, we convert it to Parquet, and the metadata that we've been now tracking along, we are adding as columns to the Parquet files so that we, for, for each record, we can keep track of like what was the original file, when was it delivered, and so on. And then, and then kind of a final piece of that is that after the raw data has now been created, we have a validation step where we check that does it meet our expectations uh, like uh, are there any issues with this batch of data that we are now getting or is it good to make available for for the next step and and this kind of gets to the what we have had to build in order to like manage all of this for for a lot of different sources coming in is that we have very like systematic conventions like all of these different stages we have like a like a S3 prefix pattern where we are setting things like a, like what source it is. It's one piece of it. Which environment is this dev or prod data? Uh, is this uh, maybe we have multiple streams from a single source? Which stream it is? Which stage of this step is? And we we kind of keep track of the files in these locations according to this convention. And in order for our pipelines to easily do that, we have built like uh, tools like path generators that they will like enforce that these conventions are met. We know where the data is going. We keep track of all those locations when we go through. And once kind of that framework has been put in place, now it's reasonably easy to like add new pipelines to that uh, framework uh, in a systematic manner. But we did not have all of that in place when we started to like build the first ingestion pipelines to get our first data sources in. And the, and then it was kind of all over the place. Like the, it was very hard to track like where this data is. You wouldn't really like, like know where to find it. And that was really messy. It sounds like a really intense stage um, within your data process is, do you think your ingestion layer is the most data intensive stage at Komodo Health? So that's, um, that certainly is one of the, uh, one of the big ones. Because there is also, like after that raw ingestion, what we still do under data ingestion to is then get from the raw data model that the data is delivered in to a unified data model. Like, for example, in case of the, the claims data, uh, if we have that coming from multiple sources, they all have their own use cases and data models that they use. But in order for us to use it systematically, we need to put it into a unified data model. And that data processing part is now very, uh, that, that needs a lot of domain knowledge of the data to understand that you are doing it correctly. There's a lot of business logic in those transformations and you might need to do quite a, uh, quite a lot of like data processing in those steps. And that certainly adds to the like heaviness of the, of the ingestion phase before it gets to this like next layer that makes the reconciled data products and then the third layer that would be more like client facing applications. But in those layers as well, they, they have a reasonably large amount of data processing included in them, especially the creating the reconciled data products. So th that certainly is, is also very data intensive layer. And then some of the applications and analysis, depending on how much of that is done before uh, the, the kind of final is available for the client. They may or may not be very uh, like reasonably data intensive as well. So it's kind of throughout the company where we have uh, a lot of data processing going on. What were the the biggest challenges that you faced as you built up this infrastructure? I mean, you you have a lot of tooling in place to manage all these different pipelines. I'm curious, what what are the events or the issues that came up that prompted the build out of all these different areas of your, your scaffolding and your, your infrastructure? Yeah, I think a big driver often has been kind of realizing the shortcomings of the previous, uh, uh, like, uh, because kind of giving a bit more context like this, like data ingestion as a separate unit was kind of started uh, a few years ago. Before that, we were so small that we just had 
all the data engineers in one team and they are just doing whatever is data engineering. And through all through this time, the company has grown a lot. And every year we look very different than what it was before. So now that kind of came to the situation that we started reasonably small at data ingestion that, hey, we have a bunch of sources, need to build up some pipelines, get some infrastructure running, and we need to do it like yesterday. So then it is like, okay, let's get some pipelines running. We think about what architecture would make sense, try to come up with the pipelines to get the data in and things are working. We get the data, everybody's happy. And then we start to realize that, okay, more sources are coming. We didn't perhaps have like all those conventions in place at the time, but the pipelines, we need to build new ones. We need like new flexibility in, in like, well, there wasn't even like convention that would be required to have flexibility. All of them are kind of like their special flowers at this point. And then we start to realize that, oh, okay, now we need to go back and change something on the first one because the delivery changed somehow. But now that looks different than what we are building right now. And then we need to onboard a new member and each pipeline looks different. And and there's like, wait, what's going on here? And then we are like, okay, this is not sustainable. We need to like have a have better structure here. And that has kind of been a big like a driving force that, okay, fine, let's like take a step back. Let's go to the whiteboard. Let's think about how do we want to do that. And then we start to like usually then once we come up with the better ideas, start to like slowly build the tooling that moves us towards that final architecture where we want to be, uh, start to build the new pipelines according to that, and then trying to carve out time to then like get the legacy pipelines to follow the same approaches to get all of those consistent and, and deprecate the old versions. And that's how we have like gradually built uh, to the framework that we have now. I'm curious to dig in more to the validations that you called out as an important part of your process. But before going there, I, um, I'm hearing what you're saying about being able to manage all these different kinds of pipelines in a way that scales across a growing team. And we've seen different kinds of design patterns and practices to centralize a lot of the functionality that may appear across different pipelines as a way to help manage that scale. For example, centrally defining different functions that are shared by different processes, how data gets read and written across the data lake and into the warehouse, how operators for tools like Airflow are defined in more of a central way. So I'm, I'm curious to hear more about the this framework that you've built up internally and, and how you minimize the the degree of change that it that may arise when you have all these different data sets and different ways of, of working with data across a big team like this. Can you talk any any more about um, how you've built up this this centralized feeling framework? Yeah, I suppose a big like um, it, it's certainly been an iterative process. I think that's kind of like important to know this, but we kind of did it such that we introduced like um, like some unification uh, like um, when we started to have more and more but we kind of had to do a bit like a bigger change at some point that okay now we have already had a lot of different like sources coming in we we start to see what are what are the patterns like well, how do we need to handle what what are these logical stages that we can come up with does do all of these stages make sense for all our uh, sources that we have now do we have a reason to believe that they are defined like in a very generic way that they can be applied to different situations, even different types of data? Would it make sense for those as well? Is there like a logical structure that kind of handles like more variation than, than just a specific case? And after we've kind of like been happy with that, that, okay, yes, we see that like now, now we think that this, this, this does meet the requirements then we kind of start building that one. And and if there's still is something that, hey, next source comes in and something new comes, then we kind of think about that, okay, what is the new tool that we now need to create? And is our overall architecture such that these tools can be added uh, one by one uh, or in a more like a kind of incremental fashion? And 
I think the main part there is kind of figuring out those logical steps and then maintaining that logic very rigorously and then just adding more tools to handle different parts of that set. And, and that has been kind of the, the key to success in that front. Interesting. Um, so going back to the, the validation area that you mentioned before, what are the most important validations that you've built up, built up and what kind of challenges did you see that, that caused you to invest in, the, in this particular layer and, and where you chose to spend attention? When it comes to validations, we have like um, different kinds of validations and different parts of, of the data quality. And I think one, well, perhaps one of the most like important ones and uh, that we really have to have is that when in that raw data validation, when we have a new batch of raw data, we do a bunch of validations to make sure that there are no like compliance related issues with it. And, and that's, uh, uh, well, somewhat obviously like very important that if you, we would have any unexpected data elements, like we have de-identified, expected to have a de-identified data set, what if identified mobile information is sent there. That would be in violation of uh, what we expect that data set to be and how uh, we can have it, like use that data. That is kind of something that needs to be captured very early uh, to make sure that uh, there is a small blast radius if something like that happens. On the other hand, when we go through all these steps to get the data to the final uh, unified format, then we get to the point that the downstream data users are kind of interested that like, okay, is this data now according to expectations? That does it match our data dictionary and that sort of agreements? Uh, did we get it in timely fashion? Uh, would be another uh, factor they would look into. And we kind of emphasize then this final QA part that we will check that the data batch that we are now delivering to, to the downstream, that it matches all of these expectations. And we kind of internally verify that we have as good mapping from the raw data model to the unified data model, but kind of emphasize on that like final, uh, final QA before it made available to downstream. Because we feel that that's the most important in that sense that uh, there's a, the pro of that approach is that the downstream user that needs the data will get the best possible. Uh, the con of that is that if we don't validate some, at some earlier step, uh, we might capture issues only at the very end, and then we might need to like reprocess more. Uh, but that usually is our design that, okay, let's choose first to do the ones that affect the downstream, and then we get to the ones that kind of make our life easier, that we capture issues earlier, and then don't need to repeat as much. Uh, work when solving problems. As far as today goes, what are some issues in data quality that you're still experiencing or general quality of the overall system? In terms of the data quality, I think, well, I, I suppose like a biggest, like a most commonly like found issue that we have that affects data quality is just um, deliveries being late. That That kind of doesn't perhaps perhaps affect the, the quality of the batch itself, but just getting it late obviously is a is something that our system needs to handle. And actually that is something that's so common that we kind of had to change our system like uh, a little bit like the logic, how do we handle late deliveries? And when you say late deliveries, you mean delivery from the data provider. So this might be a, a hospital system, an insurance company, not sending you data that you expect at a certain time and it, it actually arriving at that time? Correct, correct. That's that's what I mean, that the, from the source, if we expect to get, let's say, one batch every day, and then this day we actually don't see the data and we are like, wait, what's going on? And maybe it comes the next day, they just missed it one day and then they deliver it at us the next day. That happens pretty often. And we used to have a system that we would tie, often in this, like, depends on a source, but quite few sources on that sort of deliveries, they indicate in the file name, like what day this data is for, which day for what day, day it is. So we used to have a logic that we would pick up that when we have a pipeline execution, it will uh, 
take the execution date and match it to the file name. And that's how we are picking up the right files as expected. But we realize that now we have a situation that if there is a late delivery, the pipeline runs, it doesn't find the file, we would need to like manually rerun that pipeline so that it could pick up the file again. And we, we changed, we kind of solved this problem so that we wouldn't need to have that overhead by changing our logic such that we pick up all the files delivered with a timestamp in a specific time period. That when the pipeline runs, it looks at, okay, yesterday, what were all the files that were delivered? Maybe it's just the one that we expect. Maybe it was two because we didn't get any on the previous day. But let's just pick up all of them. And then these late deliveries are like automatically captured according to schedule without need for like manual intervention. We see different prioritization or escalation of these, these different kinds of issues, data delays or uh, issues in the content of data. I'm curious why within um, why within uh, in Komodo this the, the data delay is is still such a, a severe problem. Is it because that um, all other problems have been uh, fairly adequately solved, or is it that this this problem in particular is one that's just more critical and acute and causes a bigger impact to the business when it occurs? What, why is this? Uh, why does this remain as, as still a, a big challenge? On that, I wouldn't consider it, especially now when like because of the number of sources, it's not perhaps the most impactful. It, it's just most common. Mm -hmm. So then from kind of the perspective of the data ingestion team that needs to think about how much time are we spending on solving this problem, it, it's just very time consuming. But if we have several sources and one of them is slightly delayed, it doesn't perhaps make a big difference in terms of the big picture of how much data per day is made available for downstream. And, and not necessarily the most uh, impactful in that sense. And when it comes to the more impactful ones, obviously, if there is like a bigger, like a, it's not just a bit of a blip in the data delivery, that there is like a longer outage that it takes several weeks before uh, some, some major source would be back online. Maybe there is an issue on the delivery. That might obviously have impact. But then if there are, like unexpected, like if there are a bad batch of data that is being delivered, something is not captured in our system or, or there is some logical error in our transformation and that would be like made available through these layers, then that can have like big impact on the downstream users, uh, especially in cases where like, um, let's say there is analysis done on that data and that is already delivered to a client. And then we recognize that, oh, wait, there was actually a bad batch, we need to delete something. Now, all of that analysis will change and it can be very difficult to then uh, go back to, to like changing all that analysis and, and like handle that uh, like, a, like a client uh, experience in, in these scenarios. And that's why we kind of have data validations in a lot of these stages to kind of capture things as early as possible. And if I would give like a one example like a concrete example of that, like what has happened. There was, because um, we get uh, de-identified information. So if there's, um, uh, so, so we are using tokenized information for the patients. So now there is a process during our ingestion where we are converting uh, tokens from transit tokens to our internal tokens, which are the ones that we use to track uh, the patients when we get information from different sources. And now we had set up a pipeline for a source. We are doing the token transformation. We're doing the steps. Everything looks good. It's in production, runs wine for a long time. And then all of a sudden our like next downstream component creating the, uh, the data product is like coming to us asking like, hey, what's going on with this one, one batch of data that was reasonably large batch that they see that all of a sudden the number of unique patients is, is increasing much more than what you would expect. And we're like, okay, it seems that in that batch, it claims that all the patients are new patients. And we're like, that's, that, that can't be right. Like we would expect 
that we've seen vast majority of the patients already. And there might be some new, of course, but like even half of them being new would be just absolutely bananas. Like it, it can't be. And, and everybody being new can't be the case. We look into it and we realize that we had been delivered wrong type of tokens. It was still tokenized information. So our like compliance checks did went through. It wasn't identifiable, but they were wrong tokens. So now they were didn't match to any of our current tokens. And we had to like go back to the source to ask that hey, they, they and they realized that it was a mistake on their side. They had to re-deliver that batch and, and we had to like change the data. And and luckily it was the like data product downstream from us that actually noticed this issue so that it didn't make it way any further. Because now all the like this like numbers numbers of patients is often very critical for a lot of analysis. And that sort of a spike in those numbers would maybe raise some questions. And then especially if we kind of have to dial it back afterwards, it would be very like a, a problematic situation. Right. How long does it uh, usually take you to catch that kind of problem? There's a lot of variation in that. It really depends on where do we catch it. Like at the moment now, because like after that one, we, for example, introduced uh, an additional check in our pipeline that we are, whenever we get those tokens, we check that there is overlap with our previous tokens, our lookup table, and only then pass through. And now with this approach, like at the very beginning of the process, when we get the batch, we start working on it, we're talking about only hours of difference, and then we would immediately get an alert that, hey, this is not going through. So we would it would be very fast to find it. Then if it would go to the next step, then that might introduce, like, uh, depending on the cadence of their update uh, on, on their data product, it might take like several days. Uh, or if they are updating more frequently, they might get it earlier. It might take days. Does that, it really depends on then on the downstream use case, like how, how much time it would take at that point. Mm -hmm. And you described the, the real remediation of this issue since it's coming from the source provider, it's coming from your data partner. The, the source of the problem. The real remediation is going to that partner and asking them to fix something completely on their side. I'm curious how long it usually takes for that kind of remediation to come through because you're totally dependent on their team to be able to, to move and deliver. Absolutely. And that's again an area where uh, there's a lot of variation. It kind of a lot depends on the, on the source itself in terms of are they used to this sort of um, uh, deliveries. Like if this is kind of their uh, bread and butter operation, they have like a well sophisticated engineering teams, they recognize the issue, they have their own ways to like fix things. It can be that a few days later w we get a new delivery, maybe even the next day. They can be very responsive. If it is something that they're kind of more puzzled what the problem is, then it might take a little bit longer, uh, but they tend to be pretty reactive. On the other hand, some of the sources might be like less sophisticated when it comes to their like engineering side, and they might take a longer time to troubleshoot what that action or what that problem was about, uh, coming up with an like solution for this sort of situation, and and then it might take like uh, like a longer time for them uh, to to then deliver that. So then all of a sudden, one or two weeks might pass before they figure out that okay, how do we actually like fix this problem. Do you feel that Komodo Health has any leverage on the quality of these sources? Or is there no direct relationship where you can actually influence the quality? Yeah, that depends a lot on the on the type of partnership. So then what we in some situations we have like more levers we can pull, others not so much. We've kind of found that the very important part of that is the very beginning of that partnership. That when we are setting up the process, uh, making the agreements, that we are kind of like taking the driver's seat to to like make sure that all the boxes are ticked, that we are on the same page. Make no assumptions. Always verify that we are on the same page. Otherwise, you get very uh, weird uh, situations, and you wouldn't expect that to happen. And 
And so that's kind of the important part to like make sure that we are on the same page. And even in that case, there may or may not be like a way to to say that maybe they have a set in process and they just can't really make any changes uh, to it. Or, or maybe it is that they are actually like setting up this sort of operation more or less for the first time. And anything that we can kind of like suggest and recommend might be actually very useful information for them as well. And, and kind of as an example for that, like um, when a lot of these deliveries can have multiple files and it's not necessarily always clear how many files should you expect? There might be variation of how many files in a batch should be. Uh, very convenient would be if there is like, yeah, at the end of that batch delivery, there is a manifest file that will say that, hey, these are the files that you should expect. This is the number of records in each of these files. When you see that manifest file, you know that the delivery is complete, so you are not waiting anymore. And then you can use that to verify that, do I see all the files that I should expect? Do I see all the records that I should expect? And that's something that we didn't think about that at the very beginning when working with the very few sources. But then when we saw that delivered the first time, we were like, oh, this is very useful. Like, why don't we do this? And why don't we get all these sources to do that? And most of them are perhaps not like trying and changing their ways if they have already set up something. But this is something that we have brought into discussion with some of the partnerships that, hey, can you deliver us this sort of manifest? And then maybe that's like, oh, yeah, they didn't thought about that. But now... Maybe they are able to do that when we bring it into the discussion. So kind of being active never hurts and asking for these updates. And sometimes if there is like a really in the contents of the data, we, we see some like degradation, uh, degradation in, the val in, the, in the quality of the data, we also might like really need to get into like tough discussions that, hey, we need to find out something like this is not what we expect and what it has been before. So there are some situations like that where we, and we also then like may, may be able to like have enough leverage to, to increase the quality. What kind of SLAs does Comodo as a data provider have with your own end customers? Because it sounds like there's some sort of agreement you essentially want to guarantee from your data providers. You are also a, a data provider or an insight provider in some form. Is there something similar that you're guarantee, guaranteeing to your end users or customers that helps ensure that, that you're sending data, you know, the proper way sort of down this value chain. There obviously is like uh, agreements on that area as well. And that really depends on the, uh, like the client facing application, like what type of it is, like, is it a, uh, if the delivery is like a, like a batch of alerts based on different rules that we have decided on. So then that has to be delivered timely and there needs to be an agreement like in which format it is and how, how is that, when should they expect it. Uh, and then in some other like applications where it's more like allowing the user to interact uh, with, with the data to find, uh, like, like analyzing patient populations and whatnot, then in that sort of situation, the agreements of keeping the data fresh and so on are like very different. Uh, and in that case, and kind of with our, and then also as a data ingestion team, we need to have agreements with our like direct downstream uh, teams as well, that uh, for the next team, like what is the shape of the data that it follows the data dictionary, what sort of expectations there is for, even, for each batch, for example, that it's deduplicated, that there are not duplicates within a batch uh, might be an agreement that we have with them. And then also, not so much like when we can deliver the data because we are kind of at the mercy of the source to some degree, but we might have an like um, agreement in terms of like how quickly are we acting to the data. That, okay, like when the data drops, maybe we say that for daily delivery within 24 hours, you should expect to see the data that we want to provide it as quickly. If the data is not delivered, we can't deliver it, but at least then we need to have an agreement that we need to uh, at what point do we need to notify them that given alert that, hey, this and that source is now delayed, like don't expect the data we are, you know, contacting them, working on it, but just so you know, the data is not being delivered. And that's kind of a, then that keeping that communication is an important part of it. So you may have some agreement that says if data is delayed, it's your obligation to 
um, find that problem in a X hour period and to communicate that problem to your end client within a Y hour period, something like that within that, that formal or informal SLA that you set. Yeah, that, that's fair. Johannes, we're coming up on time. So I wanted to ask for listeners who are part of data teams that are experiencing similar challenges like you do at Komodo, what advice would you give um, for them to ensure data quality? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would I would say that perhaps like the thing that we found most useful, both for data quality and, and overall for for our like architecture and system is to to like come up with these conventions and definitions uh, to build as much structure as possible. Because when there is that much complexity, uh, it's it's easy to kind of do what we did at the beginning, that everything, every pipeline is its own special flower, it's doing its own thing. And that besides makes it very difficult to manage the pipelines themselves and make sure that the deliveries are going through. It also means that how do you handle the QA um, different data quality checks, validations, like you would need to tail handmade that for all of the pipelines in that sort of scenario. But if you are able to put some structure in place that you have like more clear stages that are being followed and that logic is well defined, now you can think about that, okay, these pipelines are following this structure when I create different like validations and, and QA checks uh, along this structure. I then know how to repeat that uh, for different uh, for different pipelines, for different sources, for different data that is coming in, and then and, and that also allows potentially even automating uh, more easily some of that testing. So I think that that would be kind of a a key player to get it uh, like get the data quality up in such a complex situation. When other teams are looking for for help with these kinds of issues and are shopping around for for tools, what what would you recommend for organizations like yours that are dealing with lots of these external data sources that depend a lot on the reliability of these outside um, these outside data vendors for good quality um, teams that that look similar? What would you recommend for them? Yeah, the the couple of pointers that I could give is that. Uh, it, it might seem somewhat obvious, but first of all, make sure that you have a very thought through list that what are the things you know that your tool needs to be able to handle. And especially like what are like non-negotiables that for sure this needs to be covered and there is like a, a no, no reason to like move forward if it isn't. And, and this could be, it really depends on the use case, what that could be. Let's say there is a lot of variation in the different file formats that you get, and you know that you're going to get uh, fixed with files, and you need something that is able to to parse them. That might not be something that people encounter too often. I hope that they don't. Any encounter with them I've had was not pleasant. So if that's something that you know you need to be able to handle, then you kind of have to make sure that you're finding something that can handle these sort of nuances that you have. And then on top of this, like non-negotiables, there's probably some things that are more nice to have that, hey, we would like to have simplicity in, in this and that operation. And maybe, maybe not, these tools kind of like provide it out of the box, but depending on uh, whether you would be uh, like, like kind of like, it's good to then try to understand like what would be the roadmap uh, of that tool. Like, do they already have in the roadmap to bring in some of these uh, features that you have or is there any chance for you to influence that? Uh, if you are, um, let's say you are your client paying for the tool, like what is your partnership like? Do you have a chance to like influence what the roadmap would look like? Yeah. Could you potentially like be able to, to change the prioritization so that these features that would be nice to have for you, they might actually like make it to the tool in the future and make it more valuable to you. So then kind of understanding uh, those are kind of very important when you are dealing with a lot of complexity uh, so that you you kind of know that they can handle as much as you need. Awesome. Thank you. I'm sure our audience and the community is going to really appreciate the advice. And I, just hearing broadly from the 
experiences and challenges that you've worked through at Comodo, it sounds like you put together a, a really impressive and, and uh, robust environment to be able to deliver good data to your, to your end users. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, Johannes, thank you so much for coming on. This was so fun. And um, we're that was so much information and such great wisdom. So I'm sure we'll be replaying it a few times internally as well. So thank you again for coming on. Thank you so much. Bye.